We're here at the Listen Gallery with curator Emma Gifford-Mead talking about the exhibition by Sergio Camargo. This exhibition is called Marmor and it's by the Brazilian artist Sergio Camargo. And this exhibition is the first time that Camargo's work has been seen in London for around 33 years. It's a really important presentation of his work back in the UK. So a bit about his practice, he obviously has like worked across wall relief works, working in terracotta and wood and predominantly in this show we've got marble works. Was there a kind of a tipping point in his practice where he moved away from more kind of wall based works or shifted in the choice of material that he was working with? Yes, definitely. Throughout the 60s. Camargo was making these wooden relief works that he's very famous for and the Tate have one in their collection. Um, but around 1970, 71, he really started working in marble um, all the time and it became the predominant material for the rest of his life. And this exhibition, um, the title Marmor, is actually the Brazilian word for marble and so we really wanted to make that the focus of this exhibition. So in his work there's elements of kind of chaos and, and sort of disorder but also this rigidity and very definite form and certainty of, um, of line and shape. But I wondered if in the process, sort of if you could talk a bit about his process of working with the material and kind of discovering through that any kind of flaws, imperfections in it. Camargo's process was really looking at that link between volume and plane and that was what interested him most and which also separated him from a lot of other artists working in Brazil um, in the neo-concrete group at the time and he worked by producing uh, maquettes in wood um, or in plaster which he produced in his studio either in Brazil or in Italy in Massa close to the marble quarries um, of Carrara and he sent quite detailed drawings and diagrams of exactly which shapes and the cuts that he wanted to be prepared and then his studio technicians um, enacted those and put the works together and um, so it was quite a long process of exchange but it's quite rigid and mathematical. I'm not sure how much uh, Camargo actually interacted with the material and the um, instability or the grain of the marble itself because he was really searching for the pure quality of the colour in the surface so the marble that he uses, the white marble, is the pure white um, from Carrara and he used it because it has that particular lightness and richness and reflective quality in the surface and similarly the black marble that he began using in the early 70s but incorporated into his practice from around 1980 was used for the complete opposite so it's this pure um, black marble which really has this dense opaque quality uh, which sucks in all of the light around it and so works in perfect harmony with the pure white from Carrara. He was commissioned in 1972 to make a chess set uh, inspired by Brancusi and so he needed to find this pure black to go with his pure white marble. And after some searching, he came across the Belgian black marble, which has this amazing um, opaque quality to it. Um, but it's also very expensive. Um, it's one of the most expensive materials in the world. So I think he thought quite, uh, for quite a long time, um, up until 1980, about how, really how he wanted to use it effectively and how it, he could explore it um, and exploit it within his practice uh, to the best ends. And he seemed to be um, an artist that sort of like avoided being categorised. He's described as being influenced by or kind of being a part of the neo-constructivist group but, and kind of op art and um, kinetic art, but he didn't really prescribe himself to any particular group. I think Margot was quite confident to go his own way. I mean, everything that he's done in his artistic practice, sort of moving to Paris and the strong links that he had with Brancusi, but also the teachings of Bachelard, um, and he had strong relationships with both and visited them frequently. But um, back in Brazil, he was really part of the neo-concrete movement and worked with artists like Ligia Clark, Helio Otisica and Mira Schendel. But whereas those artists and others working in Brazil were really more influenced by Albers and colour and plain, Camargo really wanted to go his own way and decided that volume was the thing for him um, and Brancusi is the obvious reference um, for his work in that way. 
The, the difference in colour, I think, is interesting as well, because there's so much colourful work coming out of Brazil at that time, um, and particularly with those contemporary artists. But uh, Camargo experimented with colour um, for a few years and indeed tried some of his relief works in red and in blue. Um, but he decided that actually colour didn't really work for him and so he just retreated from it and went back to what he knew best and kind of really stuck quite doggedly to, to his ideas, which I think is something that can really be admired. And it seems there's a real kind of conceptual quality about that as well. In His work really reminds me of Solowitz's um, work and, and his dealing with kind of mass and volume on the wall and in space. With the links with other artists, I think that's... Um, his link with European and American artists is something we really wanted to draw out and relink him with Western art history, for want of a better word, um, with this show and really fill in that gap um, linking Europe to Brazil to show that those ideas were happening concurrently. In terms of the volume of his work, I think um, the different scales that Camargo works at is very interesting. You've got everything from kind of really kind of very small sort of hand size uh, works in this exhibition, but he even worked at a much smaller scale, sort of under 10 centimetres with some of his pieces, up to the vast works, which are in some cases over nine metres tall. And there's major versions of um, some of the sculptures that we have here in, in outdoor collections in Venezuela and Sao Paulo, for example. But he also produced major wall reliefs for buildings in Itamarati um, in Brazil, alongside his kind of sculptural studio practice. I wondered, for you, where, where you thought his, he was kind of... Um, most influenced by in terms of the landscape and surroundings that he was working in because he traveled so much um, I wondered in in the work whether there was uh, obviously those shifting influences um, but whether there was one point that he kind of kept returning to I think the shape he kept returning to was was this one scene first in the reliefs that kind of curve with the plane um, it started off in the wood reliefs, but it was also one of the first marble pieces that he made, and it's collectively referred to as the coffee bean sculpture. And it's this tube of marble that's then uh, bisected and then stuck back together in reverse to make another form. And that's really the one that he keeps returning to through all the sculptures. And you see it in different iterations, in different um, orientations throughout a lot of his sculptures and even some of the very last works in the 1990s that he made um, were still reiterating or re-experimenting with that form. I wondered how intentional the ambiguity is in his work or how much he wants to tell us about or reveal about these kind of forms and volumes and structures. I think Camargo was really interested in that physical relationship to these volumes. So whether that was something that you picked up and handled um, and kind of moved about, um, or whether it's something that physically you navigate and you have to move around, look up, kind of look underneath, behind. And the effect that light and shadow and space had on each of the works in the different environments, I think, gave some pleasure to Camargo. I think it it reiterates all of those ideas from Poetics of Space, which he must have discussed at length with Bachelard, um, both in Paris, but also probably by letter as well in um, the following years. But it's really that, the kind of unnameable quality of the work, I think. He wanted the work to speak for itself and he wanted it to be an experience and for it to actually be something that changed in space. Um, so, Guy Brett, interestingly, writes in the catalogue about the experience of living with a Camargo relief work and how much it changes through, throughout the day and the experience of being with it from one moment to the next with a shift of light or a cloud just transforms it into this different experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, that's something that Camargo would have really enjoyed to hear. And I just was interested in this idea of counterbalance in his work as well, of... Um, the um, the works resting against or on top of one another but being created out of one form or this suggestion of um, of stacking or toppling or instability um, and how he kind of arrived at that or where that instability came from in his work. I think it's part of um, the way that he 
considered the forms and working with the maquettes and sort of the pieces of wood that he would then sort of put together, almost like a, working with a Rubik's Cube, sort of just testing them out and then uh, drawing them quite um, in detailed, almost architectural drawings of the sculptures from different angles to see how they would work and how they would respond to light and shadow. Um, and you can really get that sense of forms being tested to their limits. Um, there's one small black sculpture that just looks like it shouldn't stand up, but somehow it supports itself on two very small points. And again, there's that, there's that playfulness with the work, works that look like they're almost about to sort of roll over on themselves or possibly to sort of start wobbling and fall down, but somehow they sort of stand up and they really maintain that solid base. Mm. Yeah, you definitely get a sense of um, of that playfulness, or the like you know a child's kind of building blocks, or there's there's the sort of um, they're the end product of some investigation into instability, or kind of stacking, or moving, or jostling, um, and they remind me quite a lot of Alison Wilding's work. In her work, this suggestion often that works. Um, sit inside one another or are kind of in movement um, that there's a, they're presented in such a way that there's, they've got a kind of kinetic quality to, to them as well um, and I just wondered whether the, he was influenced or had made works or maquette works which, which had a great deal of kind of instability in them or were very fragile I guess because these works are so robust they're so even the, you know the wood and the terracotta works they're so robust and solid and confident of themselves I wondered if there was um, a work in the show or a work that you could think of that, that had a, a great deal of fragility about it in Camargo's early reliefs, he used a lot of wood that had kind of natural splits or cracks or impurities in it. Um, and he incorporated that into the work and almost used it in the same way as Fontana used the slashing of the canvas. Mm. And so in that early period of the late 60s and 70s, he was, I think, using that um, instability of material or that kind of... Um, insecurity or of the surface but in the marble works I think that that doesn't really appear so much and there are occasionally different veins of colors and obviously the marble changes over time and will discolor slightly just as it's a natural mineral material but he didn't really kind of ex exploit that in the work as far as I've seen and just lastly um, what was his, so his last exhibition was 30 years ago in in London, in London. Um, and how does that, um, how do you kind of cite that or compare that to, to the work that's here today? Well, the works that we've got in this exhibition range from 1964 all the way through to 1990, so it's more or less covering the whole period of Camargo's career, aside from the very early relief works in 1963, and then his pre-sculptural um, works, which were much more figurative and more like um, made in bronze and sandstone and plaster. Um, so this is just an opportunity to really present uh, Camargo to the audience here in the UK and to reintroduce him to both art history but also to a new audience. And I just wanted to finish with a quote um, uh, by him which says, the artist works to grasp a truth he knows instinctively. This cognitive process produces the works. Do you think there is a strong intuition in, in his practice? Yes, I think there definitely is. I mean, the, the looking, the testing, um, the return to sort of his principles of the curve and the line and the plane and the volume, they, they really didn't leave. They were almost kind of this dogma that he produced his whole practice around um, and it sustained him for nearly 40 years. <laughs>